Hello everyone, it's Dr. Sam Hurst. This is the 21st in our series of the October Gothic A Day, Tempts the Vampire to Stay. I did miss a day, so apologies there. I'll make it up later, hopefully. I am, as usual, introducing you to a text, giving you some idea of the plot, why it's important, and also giving you some reading recommendations. And we're going to stick with writers writing primarily in the 19th century, although this writer was also working in the 20th century. Also sticking with short stories and ghostly and weird stories, and also specifically today thinking about the Gothic North still. Now, the writer is not perhaps one that you're familiar with. You will find some of their short stories anthologized um, in ghost story collections, and there are some uh, collections available of their work today, but they still remain quite a minor writer, but they're one of my favorites. So the writer I'm going to be talking about today is Robert Murray Gilchrist. And I'm actually taking the story that gives the title to this collection, A Night on the Moor, as the focus story for today. Now, Robert Murray Gilchrist was born in 1868 in Sheffield, although he lived most of his life slightly over the border in the Derbyshire Peaks. He was quite prolific, writing over 20 novels, mostly sensation novels, and we will be having a look at a sensation novel in a couple of days. Um, he also wrote over 100 short stories, as I've mentioned, and he also wrote topographical works. So topographical works which focused on the north of England and particularly Derbyshire and Yorkshire. His fictional work, including his gothic and weird stories, is often inflected by this topographical research and writing that he did. And A Night on the Moor is a particularly interesting example. Many of the places that he mentions or notes can be traced to specific geographical and topographical features in the north of England, although he is not directly pointing you to one specific place, but rather takes different markers from different areas of the north of England to create a sort of generalised or nebulous north. And it's a nebulous north that has been entered by a southerner, Lindsay is the name of the man who comes to the north of England to go shooting, Lindsay Warmsworth. And he goes out one day shooting on the moors alone, gets a bit lost, gets a bit turned around and ends up at nightfall still not having found his way home. He finds a little shepherd's hut where he meets a woman who is looking after a fawn. She's obviously a woman of high birth though and she takes pity on him and invites her, him to her house, Offerton Hall, where she and her incredibly jealous husband Marlow live together. Now, she, for some reason, is set on teaching her husband a lesson, but it's one of those lessons that has never really made sense to me. But still, the lesson is that she's going to punish him for his jealousy by pretending that Lindsay is an old lover. She sets the whole scene up um, because she knows that Marlowe is hiding behind a curtain. And she instructs Lindsay to say nothing but A to everything that she says. He, however, soon forgets his part because she's a very lovely woman and he starts to fall in love with her and believe that the scene itself is perhaps real. The husband bursts out from behind the curtains and the last that Lindsay sees of them is the husband pursuing the wife across the moor. As you do, he just decides to sort of stay there and fall asleep and wakes up the next morning just laying out on the moor where he's found by a groundskeeper. He says, what happened? Why did I get here? What? I was in Offerton Hall. To which the groundskeeper replies, oh no, sir, there's been no Offerton Hall. Not since the, uh, not since the master killed the mistress from jealousy by drowning her upon the moors a hundred years ago. So it's a, it's a very interesting story. And it's one of the earliest examples, I think, that we'll find of the time, uh, the time slip where somebody enters another time period. But why am I thinking about this as a particularly interesting example of the Gothic North? Well, it's a Northern writer, and it's what he's doing, I think, throughout, is slightly mocking the Southerners and their creation of a Gothic North. Because this Southern gentleman coming up to the North, meeting ghosts from the past, and noticing that something's a bit weird, the voices are a bit weird, the language is a bit weird, the clothes are a bit weird, but yet he puts everything down to the fact that they're northern. <laughs> so
So he is betrayed by his own creation or sense of a Gothic North into misinterpreting his own situation and potentially his own danger. Now, if you think that you would enjoy this story, I can also give you some recommendations of Robert Murray Gilchrist's other work. And two that really spring to mind as favourites of mine are The Crimson Weaver, which is a quasi-vampiric tale and it has a great ending, and The Stone Dragon. I wish you joy of your adventures with Robert Murray Gilchrist and do keep reading. And I'd love to hear from people how they enjoyed their reading experience. Bye.